This is a book for you, Jürgen. Uh -huh. You couldn't influence it in any way, you couldn't censor it. You didn't even know that it was initiated, but eventually we have to give in and tell you about it. So you're not completely surprised, I know that. <laughs> but this is for you, and thanks so much for your work, Jürgen. Wonderful, thank you. And then he demanded to have some slides, even. Well, uh, and I will correct the language. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, thank you very much. This has been tremendous. Uh, uh, it was actually for a long while a genuine surprise, and uh, the real detail has been really way beyond anything I had expected. You know, I've done the calculations. My forecast for the number of people present was in the high 30s. <laughs> so I'm wrong again. <laughs> uh, the second thing which pleased me a lot about this day, and apparently by the book, is that it hits exactly the balance that I prefer between science on one side and propaganda on the other side. <laughs> you know, we are just on the borderline and this is fabulous. This is the way I like to live my life and this is the way in which Per Espen and Kjell and all the contributors to the uh, talk and to the book uh, have wonderfully achieved. So thank you everyone for doing that. And I, like you, uh, like the word science-based activism very much. It could have been called propaganda-based activism, but then it isn't as nice as science-based. Uh, so I like that. Uh, also, as, as short as 60 minutes ago, I was very, very happy about the seminar. Uh, because it looked as if I was going to be given the opportunity to give my talk with 10 extra minutes so that I really could talk for 30 minutes and actually for once get to say something. <laughs> Which of course all my friends you know, try to avoid by all means and they succeeded. So, now we have seven minutes left for my 30 minute talk, <laughs> which I, as a very old communicator, know I shouldn't even try. Uh, which is very sad, because this <laughs> was a very good talk. <laughs> I even have notes, I even have slides. You know, I know what happens at, then at a quarter past three. You know, uh, how many people are waiting elsewhere? Nobody's waiting, Jürgen. Uh, so then I'll do that. Uh, fine, then I'll do it. <laughs> then I'll do it. <laughs> the, Okay, so I'll do the short version. <laughs> because, unbelievably, this talk was made yesterday, before I knew what you were going to say, and it fits amazingly well to what you have done, as long as I skip some of the slides, which I will. <laughs> it, what I wanted to do was to tell you the story uh, as uh, I see it, exactly, it is there. Uh, and basically tell you how I finally learned that my wife, Maria, and Per Espen, <laughs> my long-standing friend at this point in time, are right and I am wrong, which is, of course, very hard for me to accept. <laughs> uh, they have told me again and again and again that you must be more optimistic. 
And of course, all the guys here who have spoken from their livers or hearts or whatever you speak from have repeated this thing that being, you know, the schooled pessimist, which is I, you know, the pessimist, the desperate man with a smiling face, which is me, <laughs> is not that me which encourages or erases action, you know, makes people do something. And so, as of November 2014, which is now seven months ago, I have changed my style. <laughs> I am now the optimist who is expecting the suitcase to arrive. I no longer calculate the chance that it will not arrive. And surprisingly, and you know, supporting the thesis and supporting my style change, I have only lost my suitcase once over the last seven months. <laughs> and the number of airplanes I've flown over the last seven months is beyond the carbon budget of the city of Oslo. <laughs> so this is, uh, so you are right, and I feel very good in, in. But how did I get there? And how did this take actually, you know, from 1970 until 2014, before I finally, you know, stopped being a pessimist? Well, it happened in this way that when I was, until I was 25 years old, I'd never heard about a global problem. I'd never thought about a global problem. Then I moved to the United States, to Boston. Came to MIT and within half a year, I'd learned that there existed two big problems in the world. The fact that the world is very small, so that the ecological footprint of humanity was going to exceed the small planet. And the second thing, that there are lots of poor people. And I thought, as a physicist, that these are two problems that are easily solved, and particularly the poverty one, because that's simply to take from the rich and give to the poor. And then I knew about the Labour Party in Norway that had with success pursued this policy from 1945 to 1965. So I th said, let us delegate the poverty, the redistribution issue to the Labour Party. I became a member you know, of the party in 1970, I guess, and has been ever since. And left it to them to solve the poverty problem. And then I took on the ecological footprint problem. <laughs> and then I thought, phase one, so now I need to... Uh, so I've made, so the point is, I'm skipping this thing. So I have made, in, during my life, eight attempts at saving the world. <laughs> and each of those attempts has taught me something important. And when I finally finalized stage H, the eighth uh, attempt, uh, which was in October 2014, I saw the light. And so you will see that step nine is the new Jorgen. <laughs> so the first thing I did was, of course, in 1970, when I understood that the main problem humanity was facing is the fact that the planet is small and that the physical imprint, the resource use and the pollution output, the ecological footprint, as Matt is invented you know, 20 years later, so roughly, uh, is too big. You know, so all we need to do, I thought, was to tell people that there are too many people and each person is doing too much, you know, has too high resource use and too much pollution output. And once I tell them clearly they will understand it and change their ways. And I spent five years in that uh, modus, you know, traveling the world and talking about limits to growth and uh, being hated by everyone for this. And of course, what I learned from the first five years is that talking about no growth, no children, f less resource footprint, does only one thing. It galvanizes the opposition against these ideas. So, Clearly, the pedagogic approach does not work. Then, back to Norway, 1975 to 74 to 1980, uh, I started and ran the resource policy group, which tried to apply the scarce resource thinking to Norwegian industrial sectors. So we made 20-year plans for the various uh, sectors, the hydropower sector, the wood sector, etc., etc. What did we learn? You know, we spoke. Great success, many people, Kosten and others, we were 20 people, 20 people in small Norway doing full-time, you know, resource analysis in 1979 in this country. 
you know, talking about the coming resource constraints, the, its effect on the oil sector, on the forest sector, on the fisheries sector, etc., etc. Uh, what did we learn? We learned that at once when long-term sanity hits short-term profitability, short-term profitability wins. So we spoke, you know, about the importance of slow development of the petroleum sector or the fact that the forest sector should try to use its resources more efficiently, that we shouldn't dam certain rivers, etc., etc. But when this banged into profit losses, you know, that was it. So that was the end uh, of that story. And this occurred in 1980 when I had spent 10 years trying or being scolded by most audiences for being a no growth fan. So I actually had a terrible case of burnout. I gave up and I said to everyone who cared to listen that I am too early. Like you said the other hour. Uh, give me or give them, the people, another 20 years, then they will see that this is a real problem because by then, you know, the global constraints will be tighter so that we will have more obvious uh, uh, acceptance of my great ideas. Then came the question what the hell to do in between. Uh, and uh, and uh, waiting for the 20 years. And this is when, luckily, some students from BA came and asked whether I would like to run for president of this great institution. And since I had nothing to do for 20 years, you know, I, I, said, I said yes. And, and uh, basically, I said yes because I thought this is a great opportunity. You know, here we can build a platform for the later war. You know, the war will start again in 20 years' time. Then I need a foundation. Then I need a lot of people. We need, you know, people abroad, the systems type of perspective. We need all types of intelligent people who can run intelligent conversations that will constitute the basis, you know, for the long-drawn war that would start again 20 years into the future. In addition, we could educate business leaders that hopefully, you know, would have the right attitude when they came in power 20 years down the line. So with my friends, we built this fantastic institution and uh, that was a great success in many ways. You know, we 10 doubled the number of students in eight years and we did, you know, hired, Shell hired all the professors and we, we did all the things. The only problem that I hadn't thought about, which I learned from there, was that since this school is not paid for by the state, but for by the students, we had to some extent listened to the, er, the students. This is so-called democratic, or this is the market. So we had to listen to the market. And the market wasn't the least interested in system dynamics and green economy and sustainability. They wanted, you know, marketing, finance, etc., etc. So the composition of the staff on this uh, inst great institution, you know, didn't really match my desire, but it made a lot of money and built a great institution, so we succeeded at least in, in, in getting a foundation. After having spent that, I started to understand that this war was going to be long drawn. <clears throat> And uh, clearly, I'd also learned at that point in time that unless you are economically independent as a human being, you very quickly get stuck into group thinking. You get forced into group thinking. I mean, you have to teach what the students, you know, ask you to uh, or pay you to teach. And so, luckily, one day in 1989, I understood this, that I needed a decent wealth or income so that I could keep talking about what I find important rather than what my employer find important. So I spent five years of my life making money, which is interesting, I, or it was actually making pension so that I was quite sure that once I got old and the war was still going on, I could pay my salary at a decent level so that I could keep being an independent voice. And I did this by being the chair of umpteen different banks and, and uh, insurance companies and the shipping company and the whole thing and I made money enough so that we could at least keep going. What did I learn from those five years? 
that's when I learned uh, what capitalism is really all about, since I was, of course, a large-scale capitalist at the time, seeing how incredibly powerful and useful that system is in the sense that it actually gets off the ground anything that has a market and, of course, does not get out of, off of the ground things that do not have a market. So, as long as you have the proper demand, the capitalist system delivers exactly what you would like. And it does it come hell or high water. There is nothing that stops you know, the, the flow of capital towards profitable uh, projects, which is very, very helpful because it teaches you there is no point in trying to modify the capitalist system. You must modify demand. And you keep the system since so many people love the system. Then, I had only been waiting for 15 years, you know, to re resume the war. Then they a headhunter called from London and said, would you like to become the director general of WWF International? And I said, that's interesting, but you're calling five years too early. <laughs> because the, the war starts again, you know, in, in 20 years after 1979, not now, in 1994. The guy persisted and I lost the, the, the vote uh, to Claude, my dear friend, who became the director general. Luckily, I accepted being number two. So I spent five years of my life trying to organize the sustainability crowd. So WWF had five million members when uh, I started in 1994, and one or, which is 1% of the rich world population. Erasmus has managed to get 4% of the Norwegians you know, to vote for his party. But, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we were at one and wanted to get to two. We spent five years, did never get to two. We were still at one. And uh, that's where the whole thing is. What did we learn from this? We learned that it is very difficult to organize those groups that belong to a minority who is trying to fight to get their voice heard. You can do a lot, but it is not easy. We learned to use indicators during that period to highlight the trends that we wanted either to strengthen or to, to weaken. Then, uh, having done this, I thought now the 20 years had passed, and so we were in 1999, and now the war could start again. And so the question is, where does one put in one's effort? And the conclusion at the time was business, because I answered at the time, just like you did, uh, what do you want me to do? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm getting older. Uh, obviously. Uh, then uh, the conclusion was that it looked as if at that time uh, the governments were getting weaker. This was, you know, Reagan, Thatcherism, the end of it. Governments, uh, corporations were getting stronger and they had already for eight years organized themselves into the World Business Council for Sustainable Development that pushed sustainability. And so I decided that probably using business as the, 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 the vehicle you know, to move uh, the sustainability front it would be the good thing to do. So I spent five years on the advisory council, so Dow Chemical Company and the British Telecom, and with Paul and all my great friends you know, in the international circuit. We have been running courses and programs and executive programs and lobbied and infiltrated and done all the things we can do in order to so-called assist. John is, of course, the most suave of us. He keeps his suit and he never, you know, hits faces and things like this. The rest of us are a little more uh, robust in our approaches, uh, but none of us work. It, it doesn't work that much, but uh, the CPSL, you know, the Cambridge Program for Sustainability Leadership, has traveled the world as a you know, and we must have influenced 2,000, 5,000 people who have gone to our you know, four-day programs being told that sustainability is this D thing. What did one learn about that? And we had, of course, the corporate responsibility uh, era here at the school. What did we learn from this? We learned from this that well-meaning corporations 
can do a lot in the, in the direction of moving themselves in a more or less unsustainable direction, but they can't move beyond profitability. You know, they can do all the cheap things. They can have 50% women in the board and they can stop mistreating, you know, the, the uh, what's that called? Those that are expecting babies, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but, but, but uh, they, you know, at once when you start talking about things that really cost, they can't because, of course, they are in a competitive situation and under regulations. So, Five years, and then I understood that we get this far, not farther. Then, luckily, the Minister of Environment called in 2005 and said, could you please run the commission that I would like to establish that is going to make a plan for how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Norway by 60% by 2050. And I said, what a godsend. Finally, you know, here is my opportunity. Finally, I'm asked to do something, you know, for those that I've been fighting for all the time. And so I got my commission. We worked for 18 months. We produced a 15-point plan for how Norway can reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by two-thirds by 2050. And the total cost was 2,000 Norwegian kroner, $300 uh, per person per year using established technology, could be passed by 15 resolutions in Parliament. I thought I was God, you know, I expected to get a big applause, spent four years trying to sell this plan to the Norwegian electorate. At this point in time, 1.5%, no, so 10% of the 15 recommendations has been passed. Uh, we have, Rasmus has, gone into Parliament on this platform and he managed to convince you know, roughly 3% of the Norwegian population that this is a good idea. My reading, you know, before November 2013, is that 97% of the Norwegian population still thinks it's an idiotic idea to pay $300 per uh, person per year in order to create a better world for the children and grandchildren you know, in 2050. So, 45 years, 3% is on our side, thanks to Rasmus. <laughs> uh, fine, then I got pissed off again, and so we, we got to, to strategy number eight, so I'm getting close to the end, I'll make it. Uh, so strategy number eight, and then I was depressed once more, I said, okay, since they are not willing to listen to my advice, I know I even understand it, they are not willing to pay the $300 per person a year in order to create a good future. Let me do the final blow. Let me tell them how bad the world is going to get if they continue behaving the way they behave, instead of listening to my and John's and Paul's and John's good advice. So I wrote 2052, totally alone with the help of Ulrich. Uh, and and uh, this great book, 2052, do I have a picture of it? Yes, I have a picture of it here. <laughs> Appeared in 2012, of course, in the United States. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it tells exactly what will happen over the next 40 years in the five different regions of the world. And it is, of course, totally correct. Uh, and the last five years have not proven us wrong on any of our quantitative forecasts about what will happen. For instance, the Xi, uh, the President Xi, uh, President Obama agreement. You look in my book, written in 2011, we have exactly those numbers that Xi said CO2 will peak in China in 2030. 2030. Then Obama said, we will cut, US will cut greenhouse gas emissions by 27% from 2005 to 2025, I think were the numbers. In our book, 20%. So it means that we assume that Obama is not going to get the whole thing through parliament, which I think is good. <laughs> so this book is, of course, absolutely great. Uh, the, and the only thing is, that it doesn't sell well. It is now out in. A, it, it, no, no, listen. It doesn't sell well in liberal democracies. It is out in like 110,000 copies in eight languages. 
Out of those 110,000 copies, only 18,000 are in English. So it means that, you know, th this is a bestseller in China, Japan, South Korea and Germany. That's where it really goes like hotcake and this is now where I get the opportunity to work. And guess why? This is of course because these are the nations that can build the future according to plan instead of building the future according to profitability. And I think that that's the important thing. We need to get back to the Norway that existed from 1945 to 1965 when we built the nation according to plan rather than building it according to what happens to be profitable. And that's the important thing. And this is what I'm trying to say when you know, I'm irritated about democracy and short-term democracy and short-term capitalism. So how do I manage to turn this horrible thing into a positive end? And this I do by pressing the button. Here is from November 2013, the new Jorgen. I am now on my ninth attempt at saving the world. And it says next, it doesn't say final. It's the next one. And now I am going to push policy, which has a short-term advantage for a majority of voters. You know, instead of coming up with all these idiotic ideas that I've come up with all over the years, along with my good friends all over the movement, we will now concentrate our effort on trying to get policies through that do have a democratic support. And so I'll mention, you know, the first thing is when you want to introduce electric cars, you know, the easy way to do this is to allow them to drive in the bus lane. You know, do you get a short-term advantage? So people then buy electric cars, not because they save the climate, but because they drive in the bus lane. Fine. <laughs> Uh, the United States should, of course, Al Gore, my dear friend, should, of course, have suggested that the United States should electrify their car fleet, running it on electricity from windmills in the prairie in order to s become independent of the sad uh, Mideast, you know, rather than doing what they did. This was done in order to have a long-term advantage in the climate here. The, uh, so, the question is, are there then policies around that would have uh, gathered, uh, that can gather democratic support in the short term? And I think there are two important ones. The first one is green growth. This idea that society can actually take money and pay unemployed people and capital to solve problems you know, that otherwise will not be solved because they're not profitable. So green stimulus packages or green growth is something I think is still sellable. And then I think this idea, and that's my final word, about increased vacation. Compulsory vacation doesn't sell. But I do think that if I get the opportunity to talk to, about, to people about the great advantage in increasing the number of vacation days by one or two every year. So instead of having a wage negotiation at the end of the year where you ask for 3% higher salary, you just ask for 3% more vacation days. And I think this idea, you know, systematic increase in annual vacation days, that is it. And when you think about it, this will reduce production growth, this will reduce consumption growth, and this will finally reach my part of the deal with the Labour Party. Namely, it will stabilise and decline the ecological footprint. Thank you for coming. I have, before we give him applause, uh, a suggestion for a short-term advantage. What about having a drink with you? <laughs> so there is a reception over there. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, I'm honoured. <laughs> <laughs>